There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Tearing down five investing taboos on this episode of Shauna Shares Community Q&A. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash cdspecials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC. Welcome back to the show. It is so good to have you on this episode of Shauna Shares Community Q&A. So today's question comes from Laquisha, and she says, Hi, Shauna. Thank you so much for answering my question. I really want to start investing, but I keep getting hung up on all the chatter out there. I can't figure out if I'm supposed to wait to start investing until I've paid off all my debt, or is that not smart to do? Also, it just feels like I need to be an expert at investing to do it well. I know that's not true, but man, it just feels so hard to figure out investing. I know so many people are making a killing, and I kind of feel bad that I haven't started at all. You know what I mean? You've done so many great episodes. I'm curious if there's an episode from the past that you think I should check out. You're awesome, and I so appreciate this show for motivating me. My boyfriend can't believe I care this much about money, but I just tell him, yes, yes, I do, and so should you. Okay, thanks again. (laughs) Laquisha, I love this. (laughs) I love that you're telling your boyfriend that, yes, he should care about his money because he should care about his money. If he goes to work, if anybody goes to work and earns money, you should care about where that money goes and, and what you're doing with that money, and that money should just only be there to serve 
what you want life to look like. Yeah, I know we got to pay bills. We got to do all of that stuff. But we also got to figure out how to do this life the best way possible. We've only got one go around here. And so it's just my little, I guess, PSA to remember to pay attention to your money. And this is a great question. I fully understand where you're at. Investing is just sometimes really tricky to figure out, but I also want you to know that it's not that tricky. I think for some reason we like to complicate investing and it can be very complex, but really it doesn't have to be to to start investing. And there are so many taboos out there about money. It just it feels like once you feel like you figured something out, then it's like, well, wait a minute, but am I supposed to do this or this? Am I supposed to invest in mutual funds or ETFs or do I pick stocks or how? I mean, it's just an endless, right? It's just endless. And that's probably what you feel. And yeah, we've done a lot of episodes on investing because I just feel it's it's always one of those really tricky subjects with money. And sometimes we need a lot of motivation to realize we can do it. So I definitely want to help provide that motivation. And yes, I do have a good episode. This episode was actually from 2018 with Taylor Schulte. He is founder of Define Financial. He's also podcast host of Stay Wealthy San Diego. He is also a fellow certified financial planner. And this episode was amazing because he walks us through five common investing myths, and we're shattering those taboos. So let's head back into the episode and let Taylor take away and teach us all how to break down these investing taboos. So Taylor, it's always fun to have another certified financial planner on the podcast with me to, you know, mesh minds and share a lot of insight. But before we jump into talking about some of these investing taboos, I'd love for you to share with the listeners a little bit about yourself and maybe anything that you want to share about your own money journey, any lessons, good or not so good that you've picked up along the way that you think, you know, might really resonate with the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you very much for having me on. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Taylor Schulte. I'm a certified financial planner, and I own a financial planning firm in San Diego called Define Financial. And um, we work with two groups of individuals. We work with high-earning young professionals, and we work with traditional retirees. Um, but we have that planning-centric focus, so we strongly believe that, um, you know, I don't care if a client comes through the door with $10 million or $10,000. Uh, a financial plan is is where we start every client relationship. Um, what have I learned along the way? You know, m- most recently, and, and you can hear my story in more detail um, on the Stacking Benjamins podcast, but, um, you know, just when I thought we had it all figured out, I- I'm a certified financial planner. Um, I own a business. Uh, I've been doing this uh, about 11 years. My wife is super organized and a planner. Uh, we thought we had everything dialed in. We saved a bunch of money for our first home. Um, we bought that house and things didn't quite go as planned. Uh, I won't go into the details here. Again, you can go <laughs> find that podcast episode somewhere else. But um, things didn't quite go as planned. And I, and I think the lesson that it taught me was that um, – things happen and you have to plan for the unknown that just because it pencils out on paper doesn't mean that that's going to translate to real life. And although we preach that day in and day out, um, it was just a really good reminder for me because I wasn't a hundred percent prepared. This was a really extreme situation. And although I had my emergency fund and, you know, again, the financial plan was, um, was pretty airtight. At least I thought it was, there are just a lot, you know, there are a lot of things you cannot plan for. And so that was a big lesson that, that I learned recently. And, um, it was a, it was a challenge and now it's funny looking back at it, but, um, yeah, um, it, it, I, I was, it was a learning experience. Yeah. I think that's great to share because, I think, you know, even being certified financial planners, you know, I have been one as well um, in planning practice as long as you have, you know, it, it's for, for listeners or people who are, you know, just new on their money journey or even, you know, those that are a little bit more established, I think that they think that there's 
um, you know, this kind of like ideal place that you get to where you've got it all figured out and everything's airtight and, you know, you're making all the smart money moves. But then this thing, life comes along and, you know, it throws all sorts of monkey wrenches in that you haven't prepared for. And that happens to all of us, not just those of us that, you know, are maybe living paycheck to paycheck. It happens to people who have a lot of money, people who are, you know, kind of mid-career. I mean, it's just no one's really immune to having life throw these twists. And so I think it's really important to share those stories. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, what, what's the saying? More, more money, more problems. So yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you're living paycheck to paycheck or you've got millions of dollars in the bank. Uh, and typically when you're on that other end of the spectrum with lots of money, th- your problems are much bigger. So um, yeah, having a plan in place to protect yourself during those unexpected events and then just learning how to, how to deal with them too is, is critical. Yeah, absolutely. So In this episode, we are breaking down these taboos of investing, and we've got five taboos that I hear a lot. You probably hear these a lot, and so I think it'd be really awesome to dive into these. So taboo number one, we've got, I can't invest in the stock market if I have other debt. This is a common uh, statement that I hear from a lot of people, whether it's student loan debt or credit card debt, just the thought that having that debt then stops you from investing or, you know, moving forward. So what do you say to that taboo? Yeah, it, it is a common one. And, you know, unfortunately, the student loan debt issue is is a massive one. Um, you know, I, I kind of take an unconventional approach here. Look, uh, debt is really serious. And, you know, usually when you're holding credit card debt or student loan debt, um, you know, the interest rate is, is high. Um, and so it's really important to put an emphasis and put a plan together on paying down that debt. So I'd say step number one is have a plan for paying down that debt. But I'm a strong believer that you shouldn't ignore other pieces of your financial life. So just because you have this debt hanging over you, doesn't mean, in my opinion, that you should just ignore saving for longer term goals. Maybe it's retirement, maybe it's buying a house, um, maybe it's getting married. So, you know, the debt should be priority number one. I get that. There should be a plan in place. That's super important. But don't ignore other pieces of your life. So, you know, maybe it's only putting 10 or $20 a month away for that wedding or that house or retirement. That's okay. Um, But just do something for it. Have a plan for it. So when that debt is freed up and it doesn't exist anymore, you already have that other savings plan in place. And then you can start to dedicate more dollars to it. But I just I just hate to see other aspects of, of of a person's financial life get ignored because of this looming debt. So when you talk about, you know, having a debt strategy, a debt payoff strategy, what are some of the tips that you offer people who are maybe struggling to figure out how to get a handle on some of this debt? Understand it. Number one, um, you know, the most important thing is to understand uh, this debt, understand the interest rate that you're paying, uh, how long it can be paid off for. Um, uh, you know, if there's any loan forgiveness programs out there that apply to you, just get all the facts about that piece of debt that you can and just write them down and understand it. So I'd say step number one is, is understand the debt that you have. And then you can start working towards putting a solution together. One of my favorite things, and it's super, super simple. I mean, there's you know a ton of stuff you can Google and, you know, pay off the high interest rate debt first. Of course, that, that's a no brainer. But one of the things that I see work really well is, you know, let's say you have um, five outstanding loans. You're just going to zone in on one of those. And your goal is just to pay off that one loan. Um, and maybe it's the smallest one. But what I see happen is, you get that one win under your belt and it feels really good. And then you want to go tackle the next one. And then that one feels good and you want to go tackle the next one. So, you know, if you're trying to pay off this massive, you know, hundred thousand dollar student loan, that's going to take you 20 years to pay, like that doesn't give people a lot of motivation. So, you know, maybe you have a small credit card or something, get that thing paid off and feel that win. And I think that's really helpful from a behavioral standpoint. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that advice. I think, you know, we always forget about the psychological aspect of money and how powerful that is and how getting that win, that first even just small win under your belt, how that really starts to, you know, change how you think about paying off debt. It maybe can change it from a negative thing to like, hey, I can do this, like a good kind of challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, I, I found a lot of success in it. I think it's super important. 
Very cool. So let's move on to taboo number two. So taboo number two is I have to invest too much of my salary each month to make a difference. So why would I invest anyway? What's the answer to that? <laughs> sure. Well, I don't know if I have the exact answer, but uh, I, you know, I do have. Some you don't have the. It. You don't have the crystal ball. <laughs> no crystal ball oh, here. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of these days. One of these days. Um, you know, I, I guess the first thing I'd say is uh, I just want to acknowledge it. Like, I get it. You know, putting away ten dollars per paycheck or twenty dollars per paycheck or you know whatever it might be in your your situation. Like, I get it. That that doesn't feel like a whole lot of money. Uh, you know, you might prefer to go spend it on a round of golf or a massage or something. You know, you know maybe that's that instant gratification means more to you or you think it means more to you. But so I, I get it. It doesn't feel like a lot of money. But I want to say this. It Number one, it adds up, right? Even that $20 per paycheck or $50 per month, it adds up. You'll be really, really surprised how quickly that money adds up, even that small of an amount. Um, and then number two, you know, we, we talked about putting these systems in place, um, and, you know, and being able to dedicate more dollars to it in the future. Remember, you're not going to invest the same amount forever. As your salary goes up, you're hopefully going to be contributing more. Maybe you get a bonus, and you can put a percentage of that in there. Um, so you, you, you know, you have to start somewhere. I get it. It's small. It's going to add up and you're going to increase it over time. Um, and I, you know, I thought the same thing early in my career. I, I started at Morgan Stanley at 22 years old and, um, you know, they had a great 401k program. And I'm like, what, what is, you know, my you know, little contribution going to do? But, you know, before I knew it, I had $10,000 in this, this account. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. I have $10,000 <laughs> to my name. So um, you, you have to start somewhere and just know you, you'll be increasing it over time. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Yeah. And so, you know, how would you, especially if you were, you know, just starting out in your career, or maybe you've been, you know, afraid of investing, how would you figure out, you know, what is that percentage that maybe you should start with? Are there any tips or advice? 
Yeah, I mean, if you're you know at a larger corporation that offers a company match to a 401k, you know, the, the no-brainer answer is contribute as much uh, you know into that so that you can get the full uh, match on your contribution. So it could be three, four, five percent, or maybe more of your salary. So make sure you get that that match from your company. That's that's just free money. So that would just be stupid not to take it. Um, you know, outside of that, again, I don't, I don't want to throw out a large number and discourage somebody from starting. So if it's 1% of your salary, but you set up a process to increase it to 2% next year and 3% the following and four and five and six, that's awesome. Um, you know, don't not start because you can't put away 10%. Um, what's really cool is some of these company retirement programs, uh, they have uh, an automatic tool built in that you can sign up for to say, yeah, please increase my contributions by X percent each year automatically. And, you know, that makes it really easy. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to log in. But, um, yeah, that, that would be my my answer. Yeah, I think that's that's awesome advice. So taboo number three, I feel like we could spend quite a while on. The market is obviously at all-time highs, even though we've had a bunch of corrections lately that maybe have given some mm. new investors or even seasoned investors a little bit of a panic attack. But what do you say to the taboo, I'm going to wait to invest until there's a market correction and I can buy at lower prices because I don't really want to lose my money? <laughs> sure. Um, again, uh, I, I don't want to discount people's feelings. I get it. The, the stock market is scary. It's, it's hard. You know, a lot of people don't understand exactly how it moves and why it moves. So I, I, I do want to acknowledge that I get it. It can be scary, but when we talk about recent market volatility and all time highs and blah, 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 my, my answer is, is who cares? Right. Like if you have a plan in place for the next 30 years, if you're not going to touch this bucket of money for 30 years, who cares what happens in the market today or last week or next month? Like it, it's going to be a blip on the radar 20 years from now. You know, I'm using these big 20 year, 30 year numbers. I would say like if if you're not investing for 10 years or more, your money probably shouldn't be in the stock market anyways. So if you're saving for a house in five years or a wedding or something a little shorter term, like you shouldn't be putting your money in the stock market anyways, because anything can happen in a five to 10 year time period. But if we're talking about long-term goals here, 10, 20, 30 years from now, like who cares what happened in the, in the market today? Um, you know, the, the other thing I want to mention is the stock market, just stocks in general, they go up 75% of the time. So, you know, I mean, in theory, you would want as much of your money in the market for as long as possible based on those statistics, because 75% of the time you're making money. Um, who wouldn't want that? You know, I mean, investing in the stock market is not gambling for this very reason. You know, if, if blackjack had 75% odds of winning, <laughs> like everybody would be at the blackjack table, but You're that's right not. On. The case. Yeah. So, um, for us young people that are saving for these long-term goals, you, you have to find a way to ignore the noise, tell yourself who cares what happens today. And then, you know, our guiding kind of philosophy is, you know, focus on the things you can control saving more money, spending less money. You can make some tweaks to your allocation, mitigating taxes, all these things you have full control over. You know, the market's going to do its thing. And again, three quarters of the time, you know, you should be making money in the stock market. Um, the last thing I want to mention, I know I'm kind of going on a, a long tangent here. Um, you know, you don't have to put all of your money in the stock market. You can, you know, you know we look at you know, call it two main asset classes, stocks and bonds. Stocks are the risky portion of the portfolio and bonds are the safer portion. Um, uh, the worst, if you just split those asset classes in half and you put 50% of your money in stocks and 50% in bonds, the worst 10-year period in history for a 50-50 portfolio is like low 2%, like 2.2% or something like that. That's the worst 10-year period for a 50-50 portfolio. So don't think that you just have to dump all your money in the stock market and hope it doesn't drop by 50%. You can make tweaks uh, to the portfolio to make yourself more comfortable with what you're investing in. 
Yeah, I think those are great tips. And especially talking about, you know, the market's up 75% of the time. Like when you really think about that, you know, I think that it helps to dispel the myth that you're always going to put money in and you're always going to lose your money. You know, I think especially a lot of younger millennials who have seen, you know, what happened in 2009, you know, that has really changed how they think about investing, you know, and Mm -hmm. it turned a lot of younger millennials into very conservative, you know, they'd rather have the money in the bank account or savings account than invest it and grow it. But the unfortunate reality, like if we're just talking mathematics is we've got to grow it somehow, you know, and there aren't a lot of places to grow it. Yeah. And and, and this isn't, you know, a get rich quick scheme by any means. Um, you know, people invest in the markets so that their uh, their wealth keeps up with inflation because $100 today is not $100 30 years from now. So putting your money under the mattress might make you feel good, but um, you know, 30 years from now, that, that money is not going to have the same value. So this isn't just a way to try and hurry up and get rich. It's not that at all. There, there's a real purpose for investing. Um, you know, I also want to say too, look, I went through 08, 09. It was brutal, but there's a lot of lessons that you can learn from that too. And you know, the big one is the market doesn't always go up, you know, and uh, you have to be prefer- prepared for that because that 25% of the time, that's the hard part. <laughs> the 70, the 75% of the time, that's easy. We're all making money or, you know, our jobs are going well, everything's, <clears throat> you know, uh, on the up and up, but that 25% of the time is really, 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 really hard. So, you know, I would spend more time on figuring out how am I going to handle that 25% of the time rather than that, you know, focus on the market going up that that three quarters. Yeah, to me, it's just like being in a relationship with someone, you know, it's not 100% of the time going to be roses, and, right. you know, yeah. birds chirping, and you know, everything's going to be wonderful. There's going to be some times where it's not so good, you know, but you don't focus on the not so good. You focus on, you know, those times where it's good to, you know, keep things going. So to me, it's very similar. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, a lot of successful marriages have um, some sort of plan for when things don't go so well and you guys disagree or or have an argument, um, you know, whether it's marriage therapy or you have a certain communication uh, you know, medium that you revert to. Um, but you know, the successful marriages have some sort of plan for dealing with those periods. And the same goes for investing. Like you should have a plan for that 25% of the time. My plan during that 25% of the time is don't look at it. Don't look <laughs> at my account. Um, cause again, I'm, I'm investing for a long period of time. So don't look at it and then go back to the drawing board on, on things I can control. Like can, can I save a little bit more? Can I put some more money into the market? Can I cut some expenses in some other areas? Um, but I'd rather focus on those things and worry about, uh, you know, wh- why the Fed's raising interest rates. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So taboo number four, I hear this a lot. I have to be an investing expert to put together a good portfolio that works for my risk tolerance or riskiness. What do you say for, you know, the people who you know, they might get their their mutual fund options at work and just have absolutely no idea what to choose. You know, where do you start with this so that you don't have to feel like you have to be an expert to figure this out? Sure. The, the first thing I'll say is, um, and this isn't like the be all end all, but the first thing that you should look for before investing your money is the underlying fees. Um that's usually a really, really good indicator of uh, a good investment versus a bad investment. Um, again, it's not the only thing to look at, but that would be my starting point is to look at the fees. So for every mutual fund or exchange traded fund, also known as an ETF, there's what's called an expense ratio. Um, so I would start with looking at that expense ratio and finding the cheapest, the lowest cost funds that are out there. That would be my starting point. And these are, you know, your Vanguard funds, your iShares funds. They're super low cost. They're almost free. Um, so that's the starting point is find those low cost funds. Now, sometimes they're not available to you in a 401k at work. Uh, you're, you're just going to have to do your best there. But it is getting better by the day. Um, we're seeing that, which is really nice. Um, step number two, again, I would keep it really, really simple. Separate it between stocks and bonds. Um, you know, pick a stock fund that's low cost and pick a high quality bond fund that's low cost and try to find a mix that you're comfortable with. Um, I know it's not, uh, 
the easiest thing to do. It could be a little bit daunting. Um, and so there are some services out there that you can lean on too. Um, in your 401k, every 401k plan has um, an asset allocation fund. So you can buy one fund and it'll do the work for you. Um, you'll find that it's not the cheapest. So, you know, you kind of get what you pay for. Uh, and then there's other services out there too, like your betterments and your wealth fronts, um, Vanguard that will handle some of that allocation stuff for you as well. So you can lean on those those third party or you, know, you can try and kind of piece it together yourself. But I would keep it really, really, really simple and keep it really low cost. Trust me, you don't need 10 different mutual funds to be a successful investor. You can have one, two, three really low cost, great mutual funds and uh, be doing better than 99% of the investors that are out there. Yeah. And I love that advice, you know, uh, and also I, I think, you know, don't just choose whatever funds your friends at work are choosing or, um, you know, your you boyfriend choose the or girlfriend. Exactly. Right. Cause they probably don't know what they're choosing. So, uh, you know, find what works for you. You know, you can be totally different, even a, you know, a spouse relationship or a boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, or, you know, whatever it may be, you can have a totally different, uh, risk tolerance and feel different about investing. And that's totally fine. You know, if it yeah. works for you guys, then that's perfect. Yep, 100%. We, we see spouses all the time that are on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. We'll have a really conservative, um, you know, husband and a really aggressive wife. At, um, and, you know, combined, they have a nice balanced portfolio. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you need to, you do need to find out what works for you. I, you know, I say don't look at your account. I think that's really important. But in the beginning, when you're first starting to invest, I actually would encourage you to pay attention to the ups and downs of the portfolio and just ask yourself, am I comfortable with this? Um, should I be a little bit more conservative or more aggressive? You know, in that first six months, you can monitor that and, and try to find that sweet spot for you. And then it's on autopilot. You don't want to look at it anymore. Yeah, that's awesome advice. All right. So we're down to our last taboo. Uh, one of my favorites, we hear a lot, you know, that you can just invest in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, whatever it may be, and you don't have to invest in anything else. You know, that is the the jackpot, the winning token. And, you know, I think right now something that although, you know, there's been a lot of market correction with it, I think it's still something that, you know, feels like that's where all the cool kids are playing. Yeah. Hey, cryptocurrency is fun. It's cool. It's sexy. It's interesting. Everybody's talking about it. Um, I, I, I get it. Uh, it's really interesting. It's fascinating. But look, if you're scared to, if, if you're nervous and scared to invest in the stock market, like you should be running screaming from the cryptocurrency market um, because, you know, you know, Bitcoin or any of these cryptocurrencies will have uh, a bear market in one day. You know, like um, they've been through several bear markets in a short period of time. So, you know, talk about risk and volatility. This is off the charts. Um, you know, the other thing, too, is I've given you some statistics today about the stock market going up 75 percent of the time and, you know, how portfolios have generally performed over long periods of time. We just don't have that data for cryptocurrency, right? Like it just doesn't go back that far. Even 10 years isn't that far. 20 years isn't that far. You know, when we're giving statistics, we're talking about, you know, pre-Great Depression here, like back to the early 1900s. That's how much data we have. So. Um, you know, when we invest our hard-earned money, like think about how hard you work for your money day in and day out. We want to invest in something that has a proven track record. Um, we don't want to just throw a dart and hope and pray. So um, what we like to do is separate out that hard-earned money that, you know, you, you've worked so hard to make and you get your education and get that job. Um most of that money should go towards these proven investing strategies, stocks, bonds, cash, you know, real estate, things that have that proven track record. Um, most of it should be going towards that traditional investment model. I'm OK with you taking a small slice. You know, we, we call it a cowboy account. Um, maybe it's five percent of your investable assets. I say no more than five percent can go into these cryptocurrency, um, you know, marijuana stocks, whatever, you know, is of interest to you to just have some fun. And I, I you know, I have my own cowboy account and I play around and it just kind of gets that, that bug out of me. And, um, it's interesting, you know, I 
you know, bought a little bit of Bitcoin and Ethereum just just to learn the process. And but um, I promise you, it's no more than than five percent of my investable assets. So I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know where else you want to dig in there, but um, it is a really really interesting category right now. No, I think that's uh, you know that's awesome because. You're right. Like if you're afraid to get in the market, if, if you know, you're not comfortable with losing your money, but you think investing in cryptocurrency or Bitcoin is the way to go, you know, that is reversed thinking. And I think a lot of times we're not like stopping ourselves and thinking, okay, well, why don't we want to invest in our company 401k or start our own IRA or Roth, you know? Because but it's boring. Exactly. And, and <laughs> the unfortunate thing is that, you know, boring sometimes works. No, boring always works. Boring, <laughs> the, the, the boring, low cost stuff works. That's why we, we do it. Um, cryptocurrency has worked for some people. Uh, over a, a really, really short period of time. And that's great. And if you're one of those people, that's awesome. Like, um, you know, my father was one of those people. Uh, you know, he he made some good money. And I'm like, hey, dude, get, give yourself a pat on the back. Like, that's, that's a <laughs> once in a lifetime return. Like, you'll never probably see that again. Um, that was his cowboy account. And he had fun and made some money. And um, but yeah, it, it's fun. It's interesting. It's sexy, but but boring works. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. I think that's a that's such a great place to, to leave listeners. You know, sometimes boring is the best way to go. You know, just do, do the steps, make the moves, you know, uh, start investing in the stock market. Even if you don't know what you're doing, I think getting started dipping toes in the water is, is how you figure out and how, you know, yeah, you might make some mistakes here or there, but all of us do that, you know, so none of us are immune to having that happen. So, Taylor, this has been awesome to talk about some of the taboos with investing. Tell listeners where they can find you. Sure. You can, uh, I guess you can go to our website, definefinancial.com. I also uh, run a blog called staywealthysandiego.com, a spin on the uh, Ron Burgundy Stay Classy. Uh, I, I write there and, and I also host a podcast as well at staywealthysandiego.com. So did you find yourself resonating with one of those taboos? I know that I have resonated with probably all five of them at different points in my life. And sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, that's a taboo. I need to totally break that down because that actually isn't reality. And you might be in the same place. Maybe you might be scared of investing because you think you have to know everything or scared because you think you have to be in cryptocurrency and everything exotic. You can't just be in the tried and true, you know, good stocks. Um, maybe you just don't even know where to start. Maybe you've been burned in the stock market and you, you're you fearful about getting back into it. You know, wherever you are, hopefully you can relate to one of those taboos and, and hopefully find a little piece around that taboo and also join me in the like, no, we're just going to knock that taboo down. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode.